Hello everyone, Derek Barefoot here again with my wife May on the Typologetics YouTube channel. Uh, by the way, if you're watching and you haven't subscribed, please subscribe to our channel. Also give us your likes and your comments. Our long running subject of study is science, history, and scripture. We'll get into that in just a minute. Let's open with prayer. Father, please help us to understand and obey your will for us in Christ Jesus. Amen. So last time, looking at the account of Noah's flood, which we haven't looked at that in detail. We're going to look at it uh, closer soon. Uh, but we learned that uh, the Euphrates and Tigris rivers are described in the time before the flood as flowing in about the same place and in the same way as they did in uh, the days of ancient Israel. In fact, not that much differently from where they flow today. There's been some coarse changes because of erosion. But, but in any case, there are thousands of feet of fossil bearing rocks below the Tigris and Euphrates River. There are more thousands of feet of fossil bearing rocks in the mountains, the Taurus Mountains that form the watershed, for example, for the Euphrates River. So it's really hard to see that that entire landscape could not have been there before the flood, and yet those uh, rivers could be said to have the same courses and flow the same way before the flood as after. So uh, that gives us obviously a problem interpreting the flood as a truly universal event, as opposed to maybe a representative event, uh, an event that was representative of something universal. Um, and if the flood didn't, you know, basically occurred and left that landscape intact, then you have to explain how all those thousands of feet of fossil bearing rocks formed before the flood, if there were not long ages of time uh, to create them, you know, with, with the accumulation of sand and, and silt and hardening into rock and so forth, and then being tilted and buckled into mountain ranges, subsiding down into uh, low plains and that kind of thing. So today we're going to briefly look at the role of reason in interpretation. I want to go back and touch on that a little bit more. Then we're going to look at some other aspects of Genesis that raise a question about a truly universal, a literally universal deluge. But first, the role of, in, of uh, reason in interpretation. Let's turn to Mark uh, chapter 9, because there's an example I want to go to from the words of Jesus. So we go to the Gospel of Mark chapter 9. May is here, ready to read for us again. And I would like to read, this is a command of Jesus in verses 43 through 48 of Mark 9. So may if you would read that, please. If your hands causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire, where the worms does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell, where their worms does not die and, and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast out into hell, where, your, where their worms does not die and the fire is not quenched. Okay, so... If you follow that, uh, Jesus said, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, uh, that is, uh, leads you into sin. And that might be uh, a desire that you fulfill with your hand, something like that, or with your foot. He says, cut off your hand or foot. Uh, if your eye causes you to stum stumble, uh, pluck out your eye or take out your eye. Uh, now, we tend to take this in a metaphorical way. Uh, that uh, to be tough with yourself when it comes to sin, to stay far back from the edge of temptation, especially where we know we have some weakness, uh, to make uh, uh, to take special care so that we so that we don't leave ourselves open to sinning. 
However, that is something we bring to the text. Jesus never said, says anywhere, that this is uh, not literal. There were other cases where Jesus uh, made statements that he did then say that they were not being meant literally. He said uh, uh, to the disciples, uh, you know, when, uh, uh, when they were talking about food, he says, I have food that you do not know about to do the will of my father. Or when he was talking about leaven, uh, he uh, impressed upon them that he was not talking about uh, physical leaven in physical bread. Um, but in this case, uh, Jesus never did that. So uh, why do we not simply accept the words as they are? Well, for one thing, it seems, it seems awfully extreme. If it had no application, if no one uh, ever experienced this, uh, what he's talking about here with being uh, led into sin by an eye or a foot or, or a hand, it's hard to say why he would give the command. He seems to take it seriously as a possibility. Um, and when you hear typically a, a, a preacher preaching on this passage, uh, he will start to say things like, well, uh, we know that even a man who has one eye, for example, he could still look uh, lustfully. He could still use his eye for sin. Therefore, it cannot uh, be uh, literally applied. But as soon as we do start reasoning that way, use, <laughs> As soon as we start speaking that way, we are reasoning. We are trying to reason past the literal meaning because it seems simply to defy some common sense. Uh, for one thing, we don't get the impression that Jesus' disciples were going around uh, with uh, one hand or one eye or that Christians afterwards were. But every line of attack that we take, so to speak, to get past the literal meaning is something we have to bring to the text because Jesus never authorized us to actually do that. We simply have to reason over it that our evidence, our common sense, uh, pushes us toward that metaphorical understanding. Okay, so here's another principle that we want to, that I want to look at in connection with this. And this is in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 20. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 10. Short verse, but an important, uh, an important uh, observation. 20, 10. Proverbs 20, verse 10. Yes. Differing ways and differing measures. Both of them are abominable to the Lord. Okay, abominable, hateful. Abominable. Abominable. <laughs> yeah, it's a word we don't use much anymore. Why don't you read it one more time for us? Differing weights and differing measures, both of them are abominable to the Lord. Okay, so both of them are hateful to the Lord. Differing weights and differing measures. What's it talking about? It's talking about a merchant or someone selling something uh, that has two scales. He brings out one scale when he's buying from a customer to weigh out what the customer is bringing to sell him. And that scale is a, a little bit false in a way that favors the merchant. But when he's selling something to a customer, he uses another scale or, or another uh, measuring device. If he's, if he's measuring out with a uh, with, with a, uh, you know, a pot or a cup or something that's supposed to provide a certain amount. He has a different one from where he, when he's buying to when he's selling, one that gives him a little bit of an edge that slightly cheats uh, the customer one way or the other. And it said that that is abominable to the Lord. That is, God hates that, that dishonesty. There's a principle there I think we can apply of consistency and honesty in the way we apply judgments. Now, we won't be perfect at that. We're imperfect people. We don't see all of our own biases. But it's important that we strive to be consistent in our judgments and our reasonings. So if we feel that it, when it comes to Jesus' commands to us, that we can bring some reasoning from the evidence of our senses and the evidence of logic, in applying it, 
If we can bring that to Jesus' commands, it doesn't mean that we, that we can just uh, make them say whatever old thing we want them to say. Uh, there's a difference between that and using proper judgment and discernment. What I'm saying is if we believe there's a role for reason in interpreting those commands, there's a role for reason in interpreting other statements where the evidence is very strong, pushing us away, perhaps, from a literal reading of the text. And that's what we have in Genesis. So now we're going to go to Genesis. Let's go to the flood account. So, and we're not going to read uh, it in every verse. It's, it's a long account. We'll be visiting some of it. I think most of you watching here will have read it at one time or another, or heard it read. Uh, it's basically, it occupies, uh, occupies, excuse me, generally um, a part of chapter 6, 7, 8, uh, a little bit of 9, the aftermath of the flood, but uh, uh, 7 and 8 are kind of the heart of the story. But let's go to, to chapter 6, because part of it is in the end of chapter 6. So Genesis chapter 6. And uh, here are some of God's commands to Noah uh, on the expectation of a flood that God is going to bring to wipe out every living thing. Uh, so May, if you would read for us <clears throat> verses 19 through uh, 21. And of every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every kind into ark to keep them alive with you they shall be male and female of the birds after their kind and of animals after their kind of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. As for you Take for yourself some of all food which is edible, and gather it to yourself, and it shall be for food for you and for them. Okay, so you get that. Noah was bringing two of every kind of animal, every creeping thing. Of course, this wouldn't include uh, the, the, the fish of the ocean, presumably, but every land-dwelling animal. And, uh, you know, if you would look down to uh, chapter 7, just quickly you'd find a modification or a little difference in the instruction there. In Genesis 7, 2, and 3, it says, You shall take with you of every clean animal, ceremonially clean, which is interesting because the list of clean animals isn't given till long after this, till Israel, but uh, it presumes some way that Noah knew the difference between ceremonially clean and unclean animals. It says, of every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female. So it would be 14, seven pairs. Um, also, in verse 3, of the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female. Now there it doesn't even distinguish between clean and unclean. It just says of birds, so presumably all birds, where you would have 14 individuals, seven pairs, if you simply take the verse as it reads. So whether it's two, in some cases seven, uh, that makes for an awful lot of birds. But even if you <clears throat> consider that uh, many animals uh, that have more than one uh, species, say on the earth today, that, uh, that, that, that there's been some branching out of those and you wouldn't have to take absolutely every, uh, what we call a species, like, um, you know, maybe uh, uh, horse-like animals. Maybe you just have to take one pair of horse, horse-like animals. Or, even if you would consider that, and even though the ark is given as of considerable size, it's, it's as a large box, if you read the, the uh, uh, and figure the dimensions of it, will, uh, you know, 300 cubits, it's uh, 50 cubits, it's breadth, breadth or something, so uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, a few, uh, uh, you know, it's like a few, more than 150 yards, it's like more than a football field, something like that, long. So it's a very big uh, structure that he's talking about. But even at that, to bring really all the animals, two of them, even if you reduce it. Now, so I'll give you an, an example of that. There are approximately 1,000 different varieties of dinosaurs and, and they're all extinct, of course, now. But dinosaurs in the fossil record, which means 
that if they were in the fossil record and you feel again that by some means the flood did create the fossil record, then the dinosaurs would have been alive. Uh, a thousand different varieties of dinosaurs, uh, including flying uh, reptiles that are classed with the dinosaurs usually. Some of those of immense size, and maybe you could get young individuals, I suppose, but, uh, but this is a lot of animals. There are many other extinct forms of animals that are quite different from what we have today besides the dinosaurs. But even if you took all the animals that exist today, all the kinds of birds, and he says that, and all the creeping things of the ground, and then he says, some of all food, which is edible, it shall serve for food for you and for them. So it means that they were going to be eating all these animals, you know, from giraffes to beavers to, uh, you know, they would all be eating from a common food stock. Now, there's a teaching based on Genesis chapter 1 that at this time, all animals were vegetarian. Now, we could, you know, talk about that later, how, how plausible that might be. But even if you uh, considered that some animals were vegetarian that are not vegetarian now, you will look at a lot of animals, and that is very hard to conceive of, that you could take food into the ark of what we know. Think about hummingbirds and anteaters and land crabs and uh, koalas uh, whose diets are limited to eucalyptus because of their metabolism. And if you would think about all the habits and diet of animals and the reasons biologically for that that have been identified by science, basically, observation, collected, and systematized, uh, this is very hard to envision. I mean, a fruit-eating bats that require fresh fruit in their diet, you know, for, and the flood is going to last over a year, <laughs> okay, if we read this account. And if the animals are eating, they're going to be producing waste. All these thousands upon tens of thousands, even if you were trying to, to reduce them, as I say, you're going to have tremendous numbers of different animals different habits that are all somehow being fed and somehow their waste is being cleared away. So I've read explanations that, well, maybe God caused all these animals to hibernate and go into a deep sleep. But that's not what's indicated when he says food for you and for them. If Noah and his family were going to be eating the whole time, it seems the animals are going to be eating also because it says that it's a common sort of command about food for both of them. So scientifically, the, the, the harder you look at this uh, instruction and think about a year in a big box with only ventilation at the top, if you would look carefully at the structure of the ark, there's a window around the top level of the ark, no other means for ventilation. And then, you know, clearing out, as I say, the waste for all these animals, it would seem to present really insuperable problems. Now, maybe not if you're in the world of Mesopotamia, just looking around at the world that you're familiar with. If you're an individual living in the Mesopotamian plains, as seems to be the general location here, uh, now, maybe when you just look around casually, uh, you wouldn't see these uh, problems with having uh, some animals that you're familiar with in your immediate surroundings uh, into an ark. That might not seem to be such a problem. But when you take the larger zoological picture, then it becomes a whole different issue and problem with envisioning how this could be. Now, one way to do it is just simply to pile up miracle after miracle after miracle. Animals somehow ate without producing waste. Animals somehow ate foods that seemed completely, uh, that it would not be possible to provide for them for a year's time inside a closed <laughs> a space as stored food. Uh, you know, you, you could just say, miracles here, there, and everywhere, 
But at a certain point, that becomes, I think, uh, gives you uh, challenges about interpreting how God's activity usually works as we observe it in the rest of the uh, places of the Bible. Now, if we move forward, of course, it says in, in chapter 8, so turning over here, we look toward the end of the flood. Um, let's read verses 16 and 17 of Genesis chapter 8. Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Okay, so now as I said, <clears throat> this could be imaginable if you're talking about just the world of immediate human observation in the, Me in the Mesopotamian basin. Uh, you could bring out a lot of the animals that you would see every day, and they could go breed and uh, fill the earth. But if we're really talking about all the animals, so I'm, uh, I'm going to just give you a couple of examples here. Uh, this could be multiplied over and over and over again. But I'm going to give you uh, two examples of the logical problem that we encounter. All right, so this is uh, our globe here, the Earth, and the place of the flood, as far as we can uh, determine it by the information in the Bible, which it does not give an exact location, but since the ark is said to come to rest in the mountains or hills of northern Mesopotamia, uh, the uh, Ararat Mountains would be would start in northern Mesopotamia and really be a group of mountains or a ridge of mountains that would go uh, uh, north from there. So that would be approximately in northern Iraq. So here where my finger is would be the location of where these animals would go to, uh, presumably, or near there down in Mesopotamia is where they would go, and then they would return from northern Mesopotamia, say, where there's a higher ground where the ark came to rest. All right, well, uh, two of those animals would have to be kangaroos and uh, kiwi birds. Um, so kangaroos are, of course, found way down here in Australia, thousands and thousands of miles from this spot, including across expanses of water, uh, all uh, around Indonesia and islands down to Australia. Now, the interesting fact is, of course, kangaroos and uh, their, their cousins, wallabies, uh, they all live in Australia today. But what is also of interest is that fossils of kangaroos are only found in Australia. That includes several different types of kangaroos, different from uh, what we see today, but they're still identifiably kangaroo-like animals that are extinct, but clearly are in the, the family that kangaroos belong to. Their fossils are only found in Australia. None of these other places between uh, Ararat, where the ark came to rest, and Australia. So how could we explain that? exactly. Uh, was it the case that uh, kangaroos uh, came all the way from Australia across uh, this water? Say we can imagine that the earth was shaped a little differently. Somehow they could hop, no pun intended, but they could somehow go from island to island and, and, and get all the way up here. It would mean that they were prevalent in Australia so that that's where the fossils of them were found. Say if the flood created the fossils, then presumably they were mostly living in Australia because the fossils aren't found anywhere else. But then after the flood, they somehow traverse these thousands upon thousands upon thousands of miles and made a beeline back to Australia after however long it would take for kangaroos to make that trip so that... Uh, that none of their offspring 
uh, manage to uh, breed or remain in any of the intervening uh, places between, uh, you know, the resting place of the ark and Australia. That is just uh, it's bizarrely strange, but it's even <coughs> stranger in the case of the kiwi bird. Now, the kiwi bird, you can look this up online, just type in kiwi bird, you go to Wikipedia if you want. It's a bird about the size of a chicken. It can't fly. It has hairy feathers and a long sort of tubular looking beak, a very funny looking animal, looks like sort of a, uh, sort of almost a soft kind of porcupine like <laughs> little bird, this ball of fluffy hairy feathers with this strange beak coming out of it. Uh, it's flightless, can't exactly travel uh, quickly or easily. It's only found here in New Zealand, so across another wide expanse of ocean from Australia. And it's also the case that fossils of kiwi birds are only found in New Zealand, the same place where living kiwi birds are only found today, is also where, as far as we know, in the past, that's the only evidence of any place uh, that they lived is in New Zealand. So this little chicken-sized bird that can only walk, can't fly, managed to get, now, maybe God miraculously transported the bird, okay? Um, but once you, you know, you'd have to say, I mean, oh, something like that, almost. You, I mean, you're reduced to saying that. But if you're going to it just pile up fantastic miracle upon fantastic miracle, none of which the Bible directly describes at all, then it's sort of remarkable that God simply didn't buy a miracle in order to cleanse the earth, just cause all the people other than Noah and his family to disappear. I mean, he's God. He could do that, right? Why would God need to exterminate all these animals? <laughs> you know, they, uh, you know, uh, Noah and his family could simply wake up and everyone around them has died in their sleep. Or if you didn't want to deal with, uh, you know, all the human remains that that would entail, Noah and his family could wake up and everyone else would simply have disappeared. God could cause them to vanish away. And then you start over with Noah and his family. I'm sure that would greatly impress them if the earth around them is filled with the, with people you know, one day and they wake up and they're all gone, you know, that, that's going to be, I think, sufficiently impressive. Uh, so I think that, that our reason and our logic uh, is starting to push us inexorably toward the more reasonable conclusion that just as in Colossians, remember we were in Colossians 1.23, the gospel was described strongly as if it had spread universally through all creation. And yet, what was really being talked about was the amazing spread of the gospel in the Roman Empire, representative of its power to spread to all creation. I think the most rational conclusion is that we're looking at something like that in the case of the flood story. Now, we're going to consider it a little farther, and it is a big subject. We can just barely uh, sample the scientific evidence that we would need to take into account. And I'm more than familiar with all the explanations from various... Uh, I was uh, raised on uh, literature that very much uh, taught uh, a literal flood with all the various proposed solutions to different problems. Uh, uh, today, probably the most famous source of those explanations is... Uh, Ken Ham's website, Answers in Genesis. So uh, if you're not familiar with that, you can go there and read their various attempts to, ex you know, to uh, overcome these, these difficulties, which frankly, I don't think uh, hold up to careful uh, analysis and reasoning. But I will include in my notes to this episode some other uh, websites you can go to for even more detailed information. And we will visit this subject at least one more study. We'll go into some other details. 
then we also want to go into the spiritual importance of the flood narrative, how it's used in the New Testament, uh, and that's primarily in the Synoptic Gospels by uh, Jesus uh, there, and in the books of First and Second Peter, we need to look at its prophetic dimension, just as we did in Colossians, because it has one. The marks of inspiration are in the spiritual and prophetic meaning, and we will be getting to that. So, our time is up for now. So, let's close with prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you for the revelation of your will in the scriptures and through your Son. Guide and direct us, please, until we're together again. Amen. Mm -hmm. And we'll see you next time.